Ready, go. Okay. I got a cat on time. I will. <laughs> See, I got I to be done in eight minutes. In the ballpark. Okay. Uh, we're going to get back started again. Um, this is going to take me a minute to do this introduction. Uh, I, I'm probably going to get all these times wrong, but. We met two years ago. Yes. Is that how long it's been? Uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen has transverse myelitis, and Stephen got TM uh, when he was a young teen. And um, like so many of you, Stephen went 18 years of his life without having met another person um, who has transverse myelitis. And then one Wednesday evening, we got a telephone call uh, from Stephen, and it's too complicated a story to tell you how he found us, but uh, Stephen found our website, and he found us, and he called. And two weeks later, about, uh, Pauline and I met Stephen uh, in a restaurant uh, somewhere in South Central Ohio, and when Pauline and Stephen met. That was the first time that Stephen had met another person who has TM. And we sat in that restaurant for six hours talking. Uh, Stephen is an architect. Uh, so there, there, there probably aren't too many people around who are as qualified as he is to talk about the next uh, subject. And I might also add that Stephen is also uh, instrumental in leading the Ohio support group of the TMA and Stephen is the vice president of the Transverse Myelitis Association so Stephen wears many hats and it's really my great pleasure to introduce him to you. How many of you were here for the last session? Next time I hear somebody say they have a tough act to follow, <laughs> I'm going to call them on it. Um, first off, thank you for choosing to spend your next 20 or 30 minutes with me. Um, I've met several of you, and it's been a lot of fun meeting you, getting to know you. I've met a lot of you at the meals. I've met a lot of you in the hallways between meals, recovering from those meals. <laughs> So uh, it's good we're not having supper tonight. I'm still full from lunch yesterday. Um, my name is Stephen Miller, and we're going to talk about universal design. And the question comes up of universal design. How can design, something that is intangible or abstract, be universal? And design is very abstract, and it's a thought that gets developed. And how can that be universally applied. Um, hopefully over the next few minutes we'll have answers to that. Uh, in my research for this I came across several, um, I used several sources, um, too many to try to uh, separate on what piece of information came from where. Um, I did that the best I could but I have um, information from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research from the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the Center for Universal Design at North Carolina State University School of Design, and I might add that they are an excellent resource for your own personal research, if you want to look that up. Also, the Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access at the State, Uni State University of New York at Buffalo. And I have several uh, good pieces of information that I uh, obtained from uh, Iowa State University in Kansas State University. And then also I drew from my own uh, professional and personal experience in dealing with design. Um, I, I want to add that there is a difference between um, universal design and accessible design. Accessible design is all-encompassing and it is design that is specifically um, developed for a focus group. Um, one example of that is wheelchair accessibility where there is a design done there are ramps added, there are wider doorways intentionally inserted in, in the design that are specifically geared towards a wheelchair accessibility. Um, whereas universal design 
those accessible elements are integrated into that design. Um, so in defining what is universal design, we're going to talk about um, the philosophy behind it that drives it. We're going to talk a little bit about the history, uh, which is going to give us a good understanding of uh, where it came from and where it's headed. And then we're going to look at how those elements can be applied to uh, a residential project or your residential project. Um, in looking at the philosophy of universal design, there are um, two approaches. One can be um, very specific and one can be very general. And we're going to look at both of those. Um, specifically on the philosophy, residential design is an approach to design that incorporates products as well as building features and elements which to the greatest extent possible can be used by everyone. Now, key words there are building features and elements. What is the difference between a building feature and a building element? Uh, those differences are very subtle, but they are very defined. Um, a universal building feature would be any component, in this case of a house, that can be used by everyone, regardless of their level of ability or disability. Um, one great example of that is door hardware. Typical door um, mechanism is a knob. Um, for a person who can't grip, um, someone with arthritis, for example, um, that knob doesn't work well. However, replacing that knob with a lever-style door handle, which we've all seen those, makes it very functional. But it also, beyond the person who can't grip, it also makes it very functional for the person coming in with their arms full of groceries to be able to open the door. Um, that is one uh, good example, a very simple example, of something that is a universal design element that can be used by everyone, but it's not a, a specifically designed element. Um, a universal element would be any standard building product or feature that has been placed differently, selected carefully, or otherwise just com completely omitted. And a great example of that is um, in residential applications would be looking at your kitchen. Um, you look at a typical kitchen, there's a, a cooktop, a, a range, and the oven is down below. And a person who cannot lift is going to have a difficult time pulling the Thanksgiving turkey out of the oven and lifting it up to the counter. Um, but by utilizing a wall oven as opposed to a range oven, um, that eliminates that need or that issue. Uh, I know my home, we have a wall oven, and I specifically intentionally placed it at a height so that when the door is open, it's at the same level as the island, counter, hi counter height right behind it. So it's very easy to take things out of the oven and get it to the counter. Um, a wall oven, there are no standard heights. They can be installed a foot off the ground or eight feet off the ground if you'd so choose. Um, so they can be placed uh, to specifically meet your need uh, in your home. Another element um, like that would be a dishwasher. Um, a project I've recently been involved with, we elevated the dishwasher about six inches off the floor just built a platform and set the dishwasher um, that created one uh, interesting design feature with uh, difference in uh, countertop heights and the breaks and we uh, incorporate the cabinet design and placement to accommodate that and it just looks like it looks like we did it on purpose. Uh, generally speaking uh, with philosophy of, de of universal design, um, universal design is the development of spaces and environments to be usable to the greatest extent possible, again, by all people without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Um, that is a very general statement, and that's a broad brush to paint with. Um, and obviously, people with disabilities are going to benefit greatly from a, uh, an accessible um, space and environment, but there are also everyday people that would have problems um, in everyday situations that, when thought through, could be avoided. Um, for example, how many of you have been in the mall or in a, a noisy space and you're reading or trying to see the kiosk or hear the kiosk and you can't because of the noise? Um, this happens to me quite often. Um, also, how many of you uh, drive your car and talk on the phone and listen to your radio without looking at it. Um, we all should be doing that. Um, for the, the sight, the visual impaired, um, increasing font sizes on signs 
is a very easy thing to do to help the visually impaired. It also helps all of us who forget and leave our glasses in our car, um, which I've, I do that. That's why I have trouble reading the kiosk at the mall. Um, also, anybody who's getting older um, can benefit from universal design, and obviously people with disabilities and virtually anyone uh, can benefit from this. And probably one of the best examples um, is right here in Baltimore that I came across just these past couple of days. There's the, the best example and the worst example of where this really worked well and where it didn't work at all. Um, how many of you have been over to the Inner Harbor at the plaza over there? It's several. If you notice, there are very few steps, if any. Um, there are ramps all over, but they aren't ramps. They're just sloped grade changes. To look at that, that does not look like a ramp. But it was great to wheel through there with my wheelchair and not have to go around the back way to find the ramp. It was also very good for Michelle, my wife, who was pushing the stroller, not have to bounce down steps. And I also noticed even the service people out there pushing their carts to empty the trash cans and change things out had no problem going up and down those grade changes, whereas trying to find steps to bounce up and down would be very difficult. Um, that is a very great example of universal design because um, Accessibility is there by default, not by intention. Uh, a very bad example, um, and I hope I don't get in trouble for this, uh, we went to the National Aquarium. And um, the design of the National Aquarium is such that they will not allow strollers inside. You have to check your stroller at the door because the traffic flow, um, the steps, the elevation change from floor to floor and the mechanisms are not there to make it convenient. So they have banned stroller use altogether inside the building. Um, even for the wheelchair to find the elevator, um, on each floor we had to ask a staff member of where to go and we were sent around through the back and, and we got through it and the exhibits were great and they do some fantastic things and the dolphin show is great if you can get over there. Just leave your stroller at home. Uh, they won't let, let it in. Uh, those are two examples that I came across just right here locally over the past couple of days uh, that are really good. Um, okay, and looking at uh, the history of universal design, uh, it, it can be traced back to the early 50s to the barrier-free movement that, that came out. And uh, there are several things that, that changed or that contributed to that. Um, one of them is changing demographics that has furthered the evolution of... Uh, universal design. Um, if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, the average lifespan was about 45 or 46 years old. Anybody with a spinal cord injury or spinal cord deficit only had about a 10% chance of survival. Those that did survive were, were put into nursing facilities. They were removed from society, so there wasn't a need for that. Um, compared to today, average lifespan is 76, 77 years old. And, uh, there are many, many people living with disabilities, and uh, that is accepted and it's encouraged. Um, another element uh, has been federal legislation that has really contributed greatly to the evolution of universal design and accessibility overall. Um, looking back to the, the 60s, the civil rights movement of the 60s um, inspired the subsequent disability rights movement, and the disability rights movement greatly influenced the legislation of the 70s, 80s, and 90s that is today our American with Disabilities Act. So federal legislation has played a huge role in this. Um, another element uh, that has, through the history of universal design, is rehabilitation, engineering, and assistive technologies. This really took off in the 50s. It started to emerge. It really took off at the end of World War II when we had a whole population of veterans that were missing limbs and needed wheelchairs, they needed prosthetics, and so the, the engineering and the design effort really increased at that point. Um, and it actually became a specialty. Um, and it's like anything, if you follow the money, uh, if, if the pharmaceutical companies, the engineers, the developers can uh, capitalize on that, they certainly will. And there was a, a need and they rose to the occasion and met it. Uh, changing economics, and this one, when researching this, this one really took me by surprise, but the more I thought about it, I thought it shouldn't take me by surprise. 
there was an economic downturn uh, in the 80s that had a very negative impact on funds for rehabilitation engineering research and also the removal of environmental barriers for people with disabilities. It was about that same time that product manufacturers were beginning to recognize the market that was broadening right in front of them. Um, and this was uh, World War II vets, Vietnam vets, Korean War vets that were coming of age, um, getting older that did have a lot of specialized needs and numerous specialized needs. They didn't just need a wheelchair. They needed a chair and they needed a walker and they needed a prosthetics. And so there were multiple elements that these people needed. Um, what that means is that the barrier-free movement has morphed into what we call universal design. There are seven principles of universal design that are uh, widely accepted and this was put together by the Center for Universal Design um, at the uh, University of North Carolina. And very simple, there are the seven principles are equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, perceptible information, tolerance for error, low physical effort, and size and space for approach and use. And we're going to quickly blow through these one by one to give you kind of a good idea of what they, what they mean. There's my disclaimer. Um, principle one is equitable use. That simply means the design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. Um, that would be to provide the same means of use to all users, um, identical when possible, equivalent when not, and that goes back to the, uh, the doorknob example with the lever. That would be identical use for all people, uh, but it benefits all users on a uh, varying levels. Also, we want to make the design appealing to all users. Um, avoid segregating or stigmatizing any users. And make provisions for privacy, security, and safety. Uh, these should all be available to everybody. Our principle two is the flexibility in use. And this is uh, the, the design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. Um, we want to provide more than one option. We want to try to provide choices and methods of use. Uh, we want to accommodate right or left-handed access and use um, with door swings, um, especially in the residential applications, depending on um, even kitchen design. A uh, left-handed kitchen is designed differently than a right-handed kitchen. My wife is left-handed, so my kitchen is backwards to me, and I use that to my advantage every chance I get. Um, it also, we want to facilitate the user's accuracy and precision and provide adaptability to the user's pace. Um, not everybody works as quickly or moves as quickly as others, and not everybody moves as slowly as, as I do. The third principle of universal design is simple and intuitive use. Uh, this is use of the design is easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. Um, we want to eliminate unnecessary complexity. Be consistent with the user's expectations and intuition. Um, it's the old uh, KISS method, keep it simple, Sam. Uh, arrange information consistent with its importance. Provide effective prompting and feedback during and after task completion. The fourth principle is the perceptible information. The design communicates necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. And a great example of that, it's in the uh, International Building Code, would be exit signs over our doors. Um, regardless of ambient conditions or our sensory abilities, if the alarm goes off, we will know where those exit signs are. They flash, they blink, they make noise. So um, regardless of our ability or disability, uh, that's one example of, of this. We use different modes, um, pictorial, verbal, tactile, and that's the exit sign example. Um, provide adequate contrast between essential information and its surroundings. Um, and a great example of this, of what not to do, is the doors along the side. The doors look just like the walls. So to get out of that door, um, 
could cause some confusion, as opposed to these doors where they're a different color, the different hardware, and they stand out. Um, differentiate elements in ways that can be described. Um, make it easy to give instructions or directions. Fifth principle is tolerance for error. Uh, the design should minimize hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. Um, to do that, we would arrange elements to minimize hazards and errors. Um, most used elements, most accessible hazard elements eliminated, isolated, or shielded. Um, provide fail-safe features. Provide warnings of hazards and errors. And discourage unconscious actions and tasks that require vigilance. Uh, sixth principle, um, low physical element, uh, sorry, low physical effort. Uh, the design can be used efficiently and comfortably with a minimum of fatigue. Allow the users to maintain a neutral body position. Um, this can go back to the, uh, the range oven with the oven close to the floor, trying to um, pull the Christmas ham out. Um, use reasonable operating forces. Uh, one of the things that the International Building Code regulates is pressure on door handles, um, especially in commercial buildings, um, and closers, how fast a door can close. Because the faster it closes, the more difficult it is to open. So they regulate that, how much pressure is needed to do, uh, do those tasks. Uh, we want to minimize sustained physical effort. Uh, the seventh principle is size and spaced size and space for approach and use. We wanted to design appropriate sizes and space that is provided for approach, for reach, manipulation, and use, regardless of the user's body size, posture, or mobility. Uh, this can be uh, in a residential application uh, on a kitchen um, in trying to, from a wheelchair or seated position, reach the, the cabinets on the wall. Um, you'll do well if you can reach the bottom shelf. Anything above that, uh, you're probably not going to reach it. One of the ways we accommodate that is we set the wall cabinets. We use a, a taller wall cabinet, as typical, and we set it flush on the counter um, so that there are more, more shelves, there's more storage space, and more of it is accessible from a seated position. Uh, we want to provide clear line of sight to important elements for any seated or standing user. And a prime example of this, and anybody in a wheelchair is going to understand this, is elevator signs. How many of you have gone through a building and couldn't find the sign of the elevator, but as soon as you stood up, it popped out at you. You could see it right away. Um, it's a very unique thing. Um, in fact, I've been in buildings with my wheelchair when I couldn't find it, and I would stand up and look around, and I could spot it. Um, sitting lower, actually, it, your line of sight is impeded greatly. Um, lowering the elevator signs, um, putting one high, putting one lower, is actually a very beneficial thing. It's very easy to do. Uh, make reach to all components comfortable for any seated or standing user. And provide adequate space for the use of assistive devices or personal assistance. Um, textbook case for this is having enough space in your hallway to turn a wheelchair around. Or enough space in your bathroom to once the wheelchair is in the bathroom, that there's still enough space to get the door closed behind you. Um, so how can this be applied to residential projects? We're going to go uh, room by room in some of these uh, and look at different ways that these can be, these principles can be applied. Looking at the entrance of, of a home, you would want to have at least one minimum entrance with no steps. You'd want that entrance to have protection from the rain, snow, ice, um, from the elements. Um, so a covered porch is ideal for that. Um, a low door threshold, and that is defined by the American with Disabilities Act as less than half inch. And also a clear opening of 32 inches. I have added the word minimum to that, and that goes back to my personal and professional experience. Um, 32 inches is what the code requires that we have clear. Um, I still skin my knuckles on 32 inches if I'm not paying close, to, uh, close attention. Um, I prefer 36 inches, uh, or I, that's ideal. Also, um, in, when the 32 inch rule came into effect, um, wheelchairs weren't nearly as uh, advanced as they are now. 
and what that means back then the wheels were not canted as they are today so a lot of times I can fit through with my shoulders and my elbows just fine but at the bottom at the floor where my wheels flare out I can't get through so in a lot of cases the 32 inch minimum um, isn't actually that functional um, if you can get 36 inches go for it and there are a lot of times especially in renovations and remodeling when that's not possible um, but I would encourage you to go as wide as you can also a secure door lock accessible from the seated position and this can be simply as uh, a deadbolt and typically deadbolts are mounted above the, the latch um, among, above the keyhole um, there is nothing that says that that can't be install, installed under the keyhole um, so it's accessible uh, easily reached from uh, seated position or standing um, looking at the kitchen this is, kitchen's designs happen to be one of my favorites um, single lever faucets at the sinks um, are very beneficial because with that one lever you can turn it to hot to cold to warm without having to adjust two different uh, faucets also if possible that faucet can be mounted on the side so it's easily um, within easy reach um, D-shaped cabinet and drawer pulls um, for the person that can't grip uh, it's very easy to stick a finger in and pull that out and even I've seen uh, very effective use of spoon handles put in there to, to pull uh, pull doors and drawers open pull out shel shelves where possible um, lower hung wall cabinets uh, that's what I mentioned before of taking a, a taller wall cabinet and mounting it flush on top of the counter and also wall ovens placed at an appropriate height wall ovens can be placed at any height um, it's just an issue of, of measuring yourself of where you would like it um, looking at bathrooms you always want to have a bathroom located near a bedroom if not accessible from a bedroom again the 32 inch clear opening and again I stress minimum on that 60 inch diameter for turning area that would be um, ideal in a bathroom um, of having a space five feet square or round that will allow um, easy rotating of a chair now that doesn't mean that your sink can't stick out into that into that 60 inches or the, the top of the toilet can't stick out you're allowed to do that I mean and because the, the critical thing in a turning radius of a wheelchair is making sure that your toes clear um, so as long as there's that space on the floor uh, it's very beneficial lever style faucets in lieu of, of knobs and sinks or vanities that have open knee spaces and a lot of this is uh, as simple as not installing the base cabinet or taking one of the base cabinets out and that can be used universally it can be used um, for the wheelchair person but it can also be used as a vanity a sit-down vanity and hose type detachable handheld shower heads um, I have yet to meet anybody able, fully able-bodied or disabled who does not like those. Um, I have yet to come across somebody who doesn't like to pull that thing off and just pour it all over. Uh, in the bedrooms, telephone and light switch within easy reach of the bed. Um, that is a very, seems to be a very simple concept, but it is very difficult to get that through, through to people. Um, nothing says that you cannot have two light switches for the same light in the same bedroom um, I've had clients that, that said we don't want to put our light switch there because I don't want the light switch on my bed when I come in the room I have to walk across the room in the dark to get to turn the light on so, well, no you can put the light switch by the door as well um, the benefit is is when you get up through the middle of the night if you need the light you don't have to walk across the dark room to the door to turn the light back on um, some closet rods should be adjustable adjustable or mounted um, closer to the floor about four feet closer to the floor will allow um, easy access and it'll also allow pretty much all your clothes um, not touching the ground and that's you don't hang your formal gown or long dresses on that rod though you hang that up high um, an uninterrupted path from the bed to the bathroom free from throw rugs cords and other obstacles throw rugs are probably the most item uh, the single most tripped up item um, 
don't know if that's proper grammar or not, but more people trip over throw rugs than anything else um, in dark hallways. And night lights in the paths of egress uh, to get to the outside if need be. Um, looking at a laundry room or utility room, um, laundry facilities located on the main floor or the same floor as the bedrooms. Um, this could be having your laundry room on the, the second floor. Um, a home I grew up in, it was a split level and all the bedrooms were way up high and I watched my mother every week with seven of us in the house take all of our clothes down to the basement, wash them and bring them all the way back up. Um, and placing that laundry room up where the bedrooms are prevents you from having to carry them all the way downstairs and all the way back up. Um, and again, it's one of those ideas that people, I have clients that just resist that because what would happen if my washer sprang a leak? I ask them, has your washer sprang a leak recently? When was the last time it did? Um, there's always that risk. Um, but the benefit greatly outweighs the risk. Um, front loading washers and dryers, and these can be mounted on risers for easy access, just like the dishwasher. Um, a table or a counter near the washer and dryer, about 28 to 30 inches high. And stairs. Sturdy, uninterrupted handrails, not more than 36 inches above the floor. The handrail should extend beyond the bottom tread or the bottom step, uh, 12 inches, and beyond the top, 24 inches. Light switches located at both the top and bottom of the stairwell. And rounded nosings on treads and sloped risers. Uh, riser heights should not exceed seven inches or be less than six inches. Um, interesting thing, when we were talking about in, in school about stair design, um, with having a typically, typically stairwells, not every stair is exactly the same height. They may vary a sixteenth of an inch, uh, thirty-second of an inch. If you get to one-eighth of an inch variation or more, um, pushing 80% of the population will trip on that one-eighth of an inch. So it doesn't take much to throw you off, um, but beyond seven inches, it becomes a pretty, pretty big stretch. In a nutshell, universal design challenges traditional design methods and techniques in an effort to benefit the majority of the population at large without needing specialization of products or elements and without requiring special knowledge or skills to use or otherwise function in the built environment. Um, so what is the key to success for your residential project? Um, you, first off, I would highly recommend um, hiring a design professional. Um, obviously, I'm a bit biased on that because uh, I do this, but um, the design professional can have some insight into um, how other elements are affected by decisions that are made. You want to find a design professional that is familiar with the philosophy of universal design, that they know the difference from universal design to versus accessibility design, accessible design. Um, understanding accessible design issues, um, which would be the 32 inch door opening, clear opening, um, that will pass code and it will um, suffice very well, but you'll also have some grumpy days when you hit your knuckles on that doorway. Um, you want them to have experience in accessible design and you, above all you want them to have a willingness to listen to your concerns, listen to your ideas and implement them everywhere uh, as possible. The key to uh, working, with, working with a guy like me is um, keep in mind that you have hired us and we are working for you, and this is your home, this is your built environment. Um, we don't have to like it, we have to make sure that you like it. Um, so if you're not happy or satisfied with something, make sure that you let that be known. If you would like any other additional information on this, feel free to track me down. Um, I'm gonna be around, on, you'll see me out at the, the TMA table. Um, I'm always looking for somebody to eat supper with, so. Um, feel free, if you have, want any more information, I can give you plenty more information, so feel free to look me up. Thank you.